with the first copies, sell it in 10 years when it's really big uh, at Sotheby's, you know, it's definitely going to happen. <coughs> now, our speaker tonight, Jane, she grew up in North Warwickshire and lived in Newcastle before moving to Orkney in 2013, where she got her first Borrey sheep. In 2017, she discovered that she was the custodian of the lost flock and decided that it was up to her to secure their long-term future. Now, Jane is going to ram you with information this evening, so don't be sheepish about asking questions, because no question is a bad question. <laughs> and now that that's done and I've got it all out, please welcome Jane Cooper. Hello. Um, the Lost Flock is the story of the Borrowray sheep in Orkney and what I've been able to discover about their 6,000-year-old history. Borrowray sheep, as you can see here, are nothing like the big, white, fluffy sheep you see in fields all over the UK. Here we have a ram in the, in the right -hand, left hand corner and he's just joining his group of ewes ready for tupping time. Um, Borrowray sheep are part of a group of around 40 breeds found now only in the islands and the extremities of northern Europe around the Atlantic Ocean. They're known as the northern European short-tailed sheep, as I'll demonstrate later, and they are descended directly from the first sheep bought into northern Europe by Neolithic farmers 6,000 years ago. This is a map of showing Scotland. Uh, you can see Orkney. And then on the right, left, you can see the Western Isles. And then right out, you can see a little dot, St. Kilda. So the breed is found as a feral flock on the island of Borroray in the St. Kilda archipelago. Now, on the colored map, Borroray Island, you can see her to the main island at the bottom. And then Borroray is right up in the top right-hand corner. They've been there on Borrowy Island since at least the 17th century. Martin Martin described them in 1697. They came from the highlands of Scotland, where they've lived for thousands of years, and were known in recorded history there as the Scottish Dunface or Tanface, which reflects their appearance. They were important for the crofters then, for their meat, but more importantly than that, for their milk which they could turn into cheese. That's a high calorie, high protein product that can be stored without refrigeration. They also provided the wool that since the, Cyan uh, since the Iron Age has been so important for warm, fire resistant and water resistant clothing, bedding and other textiles. The population of St. Kilda all lived on the main island of Herta, that's, that's the big one, and it was around 200 or so until smallpox hit the island in 1727 and more than decimated the population. At the time, it was recorded there were 2,000 sheep in St. Kilda, divided between Herta, Borroray, and Soe, which is the little island just above Herta. The human population never fully recovered from that and dwindled rapidly in the 19th century and in the 20th century, until in 1930, the last 36 residents were evacuated from the island, and with them went all the livestock on Herta. The sheep on Borre and Soe were left. It would have been impossible to get them off, and they have been feral flocks since then, as indeed they were um, while Herta was occupied. Here we have a photograph of Jenny, who farms Borrowray sheep in Chapinsay. She has actually visited St. Kilda. I am such a dreadful sailor, I have not even attempted it. It's a four-hour, very rough crossing. But just behind Jenny, in the far background, you can see Borrowray Island, and you can see it's got very steep slopes. And then the photograph beside that is actually taken off the wild Borrowray sheep on the island. And again, you can see how steep the slopes are. 
The St. Kildans, who only live in Herta, would go across once a year to collect the fleece. There's no landing place on Borore, so the boat would take them over with their supplies and their dogs, and they'd leap from the boat onto the cliff and scale up the cliff. There was a stone dwelling there where they could sleep overnight. The sheep don't flock like modern breeds. If they're startled, they scatter very quickly to the four winds. So the dogs weren't trained to round them up, as you see on one man on his dog. Instead, they filed the dog's teeth down somewhat, and they were trained to literally chase after after a sheep and grab hold of one and hold it until one of the men could come along, tie the legs, and then they would take the fleece off. When the men, men when were ready to leave Borroway Island, they would cut turfs out of the grass, revealing the dark soil underneath. And this could be seen from Herta and was for the sign for them to send the boat over to pick them up. Except one year, when there weren't enough fit men left to pick them up, they had to stay there the whole winter, and they would have survived on sheep and seagulls. These photographs are from the early 20th century, and they do show the importance of hand spun and hand woven tweed. You can see how much they were producing. And the other photo is of them actually shearing or rooing the sheep. In the late 19th century, the production of tweed was a very important part of their economy as the demand for the oil they collected from the seabirds had diminished. At this time, the laird who owned St Kilda sent across some modern black, Scottish blackface rams to breed with the sheep on Herta to try and increase the size of the sheep and also because the Scottish blackface sheep then had longer fleece. So you got more wool off each sheep. What we don't know is how many of these black-faced sheep were actually got onto Borroway Island, knowing the difficulties of getting anyone onto the island. But despite that, by the mid-20th century, researchers seemed to share, all share the same opinion that the sheep on Borroway were actually just a feral popula population of black-faced sheep that so much interbreeding with the blackface had gone on, that that's what they were. And they were called the feral blackface sheep of Borroway. And if you can just hold on to that thought, because I'm going to come back to it later. Now, this photograph of two, two well, two of my deceased rams, I'm afraid, because it's taken quite early. On the left is Bede, with his magnificent horns, his mane and beard. And then with his rear to us, very conveniently, is Boris. And what you can see there is his dark tail. And you can see it is a very short, fluke-shaped tail. This is obviously a winter shot, and the two of them were doing some hierarchical jousting. The, these short tails actually have far fewer vertebrae in them than in modern sheep. They have about an average of eight, compared to 16 to 20. And each vertebrae is actually shorter. Hence the name, the Northern European short-tailed sheep. Um, most of this group of sheep are horned. Certainly all Borrowrays are horned, with few exceptions. And the Borrowray sheep, because they've been a feral flock for so long and haven't been subjected to centuries of farming, they do have very primitive behaviours, as in not flocking, and they're the attributes around lambing time are a lot better than for modern sheep, as I'll show you later on. Now, these photographs of some of my flock show the range of colors in their faces, variation in the shape and size of horns. And you'll notice um, that's Bede again at the bottom in the middle. He's got an inverted white V on his face, and if you look carefully, you'll see hints of that on some of the other sheep. And that's quite characteristic of Borrowray sheep. Now, Orkney's North Ronaldsay sheep, 
whom we all know very well, are actually very, very close cousins to Bororay sheep, part of this same group of Northern European short-tailed sheep. Um, if you get your eye in, you can tell them apart quite easily. But you can see the similarities. These were taken when I had one of my visits to, St. to North Ronaldsay. Modern skeletal remains of these sheep in North Ronaldsay are very similar to those that have been found at Scarabray dating back thousands of years. So these primitive sheep really haven't changed very much since they first came into Scotland. In contrast, these are some modern sheep breeds showing the size, the large behinds, because that's where the premium meat is on the rear end. And if you look at the middle photograph, this is a sheep that hasn't had its tail shortened when it was a young lamb. And you can see the great long length of tail. Another difference is that Bororay sheep naturally shed their fleece. They couldn't exist as a feral population if they didn't. Modern sheep have to be sheared every year for their welfare. But it does mean that I can practice the ancient art of ruing, which is where you pluck off the locks of fleece just before they're about to fall off. If I'm very lucky, I get it just right, and it almost peels off. That's joy. Otherwise, it can take an hour to pluck a sheep. It, it's the fleece that first introduced me to Bororay sheep and the small flocks that have been in the UK since 1979. In 1971, there was an expedition to Bororay Island and three pairs of sheep were removed from there to the Animal Breeding Research Organization near Edinburgh. And this was for study and breeding. And this was done because they were regarded as a feral population of black-faced sheep, so they were of interest. When that work had finished at the end of the decade, they were sold as enthusiasts, um, to enthusiasts, and in 1981, they were recognized as a breed by the Rare Breed Survival Trust. In 2010, they were the rarest breed in the UK, and this is where I first came into contact with them. I was a spinner and knitter interested in wool from different breeds. Bororay yarn did not exist, so I set out to have one spun. <laughs> and that involved me driving around the country, um, visiting people I'd managed to track down who had little flocks of Bororay sheep, often four or six. The numbers were very small. Uh, at the time, there were fewer than 300 registered breeding ewes outside St Kilda. This collection of fleece involved me meeting the sheep, and I just fell in love with their feisty characters. Time, we were living in Newcastle, but I got my spinning friends round. I bribed them with offers of cake and a delicious lunch. And we sorted out the fleece um, in our drawing room. There was, I did put sheets on the floor. A lot of the fleece was pretty mucky. So much so that between us all, this became known as the poo party. The fleece is double-coated with a coarse, hairy outer coat and a very fine undercoat. And historically, these two elements of the fleece would have been separated and used for different functions according to their different properties. My first visit to Orkney was in 2011. And as I'm sure you've heard other people say, I got here and I felt I'd come home. Many visits followed, and then in 2013, my husband got a job up here. So the plan was we were going to move up and buy a nice house with a little field, and I'd keep a little flock of pet sheep for their fleece. And if you're keeping fleece, a pet sheep as fleece, what you want are castrated males, known as wethers, because they have the best quality fleece. Um, I knew about Bob and Ann Cook's flock of Bororay sheep in Assent, which is on the northwest coast of Scotland. So I arranged to buy his male lambs of that year, all castrated. Here are my first five sheep. And if you count from the left, number four, with the red spot on his back, you may see those slightly larger horns. Yes, that was Boris, who was deemed 
too good to castrate. So with 25 acres and a ram, the inevitable followed. Now, the provenance of my little flock was really interesting. When I was talking to people about their f going around contacting people about the fleece, I kept hearing mention of the lost flock. And it turned out that the very first sheep that were registered in the early 1980s, they all had to be inspected by the Rare Breed Survival Trust, and all the rec their breeding records had to be inspected. But there was a flock in the North Highlands, and it was far too expensive for the inspectors to go up there. So they missed out. They were not registered at that first point. And then it became very difficult after that to have them registered. Bob and Ann Cook had tried. They'd got meticulous records of all the years they'd had them. It wasn't enough at the time. The other point is that anyone with registered sheep couldn't breed with non-registered sheep because then the offspring couldn't be registered. And most of the people keeping Borrowray sheep at the time were breed enthusiasts, and a big part of their pleasure was showing the sheep. And if you're going to show the sheep, they've got to be registered. So this little flock stayed up in the highlands for decades, unregistered, known as the lost flock. I, however, was very happy to have them. This is the first Borrowray lamb to be born in Orkney called Dora, and she was born in May 2015. She was actually born during a storm in the middle of the night. Um, it takes up several pages in the book. It was um, quite a traumatic time for me. Um, Dora and her mum, Hilary, managed fine. Over the years, numbers have grown. And here are some of my ewes and lambs in late summer. The ewes wean the lambs themselves. They basically start kicking them off when they think they've had enough. So we don't need to separate them. The only thing we have to do is any males that have been left entire as future breeding rams, we have to remove from this group of females before the end of September. Otherwise, we end up with some unplanned happenings. And here in Orkney, about one-third of the Borrowray ewes have twins. Um, the little lamb on the left with the very dark collar is very special. Her name is Hannah, and she's, um, she's my daughter's lamb. It's, um, it's her middle name. You can see that the lambs are shiny bright white um, with dark legs, dark markings on their faces, some of them have a dark tail, and some of them have that dark collar or a little dark bit at the back of their neck. But as they get older, many of them, the fleece darkens with age, and in the large flock on Stronse, there is a nine-year-old ewe there, Caitlin, who's actually almost black now. The sheep lend themselves very well to agroecological farming methods, which are used by all of us to varying degrees who have the Borrowray flocks in Orkney. They thrive on the sort of rough pasture you see on the right, and any time they can get hold of near trees, they really enjoy browsing. We all work together, those of us with Borrowray flocks, as a loose collective, and we call ourselves the Orkney Borrowray community. These are low-input sheep, they don't suffer from any of the infectious foot problems that are such an economic problem for commercial sheep. They select their grazing from a very diverse range of plants, and only when they've taken the tastiest bits there do they think about eating grass. This has health benefits. When you drive around Orkney, you'll often see big white sheep in fields with mucky black bums. This dark diarrhea is called scouring, and it's almost unknown for borrowers to do this. They have very clean back ends. Their diverse diet includes tannins from tree branches and leaves, and this gives them increased resistance to parasitic gut worms and a resilience to the effect of gut worms. 
they're actually an ideal breed for modern regenerative farming and for conservation grazing. Now, we've got a video that's going to be shown now. Lambing, you've probably all seen lambing on television. It happens inside in barns, and there's lots of chasing around and hands up rear ends of ewes as they haul out lambs. This is how borrowers do it. So you might just see a little bit of abdominal contractions. And there's a bit of mucus floating around, and plop. Out comes the lamb. She's straight round to lick it. This is his lop. Um, and you'll see how very quickly the lamb starts moving. So it's already got its head up. She's licking the amniotic fluid. The amniotic fluid is... Uh, it, it's very addictive for the ewes. They, they will do anything to the scent of this. So we're about to see another sheep come who smelt the amniotic fluid. So she's licking the lamb. The lamb's got its head up. It's about to start standing. By the time they're five to ten minutes old, I expect to see them standing towards the rear end of the ewe, looking for the udder to get the precious colostrum. Yes, here we come. We could smell a bit of amniotic fluid. And she'll have that lamb dry in no time. Yes, here we go. The first attempts to stand up. So basically, I just keep an eye on them. It's very, very rare I have to intervene. Um, I've seen them lamb with, they're normally lamb with two legs forward and their head tucked between their front legs. I've seen them lambing themselves with one leg back and sometimes with a lot of pushing, they manage two legs back. These are torpedo-shaped lambs. Right, what the Orkney Borrowe farmers produce as their primary product is mutton from sheep that are at least two, two years old. They're actually about two, two and a half years old at the youngest when they go for slaughter. Um, this is sold direct. We work with a butcher in Forres, Macbeth's Butchers. Um, Jock Gibson is actually a farmer as well. Um, and he sells to some of Scotland's finest restaurants and puts it on his website where it sells out very quickly. We took the 2023 20, group of 18 mutton sheep down last Monday, and um, I heard from Jock and staff at Macbeth's that it's virtually sold out now already. Um, and it's not even going out for sale. It's being hung for two weeks, and then it won't be going out to people till next week. The reason we, it's important that we produce and we produce products because a sustainable future for these sheep can only be achieved if those farming them can make a profit. That's the reality of life. We don't want people keeping pets, pleasurable though it is. We need to make a profit. So we now have eight flocks on five different Orkney Islands, and we all work together and benefit from this collaboration. In August 2021, Orkney Borrowe Mutton became Scotland's second slow food international Prisidium. It's only the fifth Prisidium in the whole of the UK. This reflects the fact we work together as a community. We have high welfare and sustainable farming practices, and the mutton we produce is absolutely superb. We get a lot of repeat customers, um, so much so after, after in the second year of Jock selling our mutton for us, we had people who, repeat customers who missed out. They, could, they weren't quick enough on the website, so he now takes pre-orders. And this is a photo of Jock with his Highland Coos. And that's just a write-up about the Presidium Award. Part of our ethos, and for financial reasons, we have to make use of everything we can from the sheep. We don't want waste. So the skins are tanned. The wool is, some of the wool's turned into knitting yarn. Some of it is turned into weaving yarn. 
and Nathan on Stronsay, who has a small flock of borrower sheep himself, does miraculous things with our sheep horns. We, we actually have obtained the licenses so we can get the skins and horns back from the abattoir. And that was my job on Friday. I drove all the way down to Dingwall to pick those up. Now, our wool, our fleece is processed normally by the North Monsey Mill because they have specialist equipment to deal with double-coated fleeces, which are what the North Monsey sheep have. And you'd think from looking at the photos of these hairy little sheep that the wool would be coarse. Far from it. And in fact, when it's been processed in being woven, and India Whitwell is the Orkney weaver who is working with our fleece, um, it actually, I went and felt it last week, and I was absolutely astounded at how soft her woven goods were and the drape they had on them. So much so that hopefully she's out there tonight with samples for you to feel. Because if you didn't feel it, you wouldn't believe it. Jenny, with the Chapinsay flock, concentrates on knitting yarn. Um, that ram there with the very impressive horns, I think is bollocks? Yeah. Never let your adult children name a sheep. <laughs> that is Setisgarth bollocks. Um, Jenny separates her fleece into the different natural colours and has it spun up so she can then knit beautiful stranded work, all natural undyed colours. I also give talks to groups of knitters, usually from abroad. I've got some American knitters coming on Friday and to anyone else who's interested in the sheep. And when we started the Orkney Borough community in 2021, we decided we needed a logo. So 42 Studio in Aberdeen came up trumps at COVID time when they couldn't travel up here to meet the sheep. We exchanged a lot of photographs, a lot of me talking about feisty individual little sheep. And we are absolutely thrilled with the logo they came up with that reflects the character and the history of the breed. We also have a website now, which um, gives a lot more information about how we're working together as a community and what we're doing. So this is all sounding very positive, isn't it? It's great, we're doing so much with our sheep, but we live on an island with no abattoir. Orkney Abattoir closed in 2018. It brings immense challenges, both practical and financial. Getting sheep down to the excellent small abattoir in Dingwall, which is 110 miles from the north coast of Scotland, is both very expensive and, for the humans, very stressful. I have sleepless nights before it happens, um, hoping it's all going to go well. Um, this was an early, an early trip. We take the sheep ourselves because it is so important for their welfare and meat quality that they are as comfortable as possible and as stress-free as possible on the journey. And it makes a huge difference that we do it ourselves. They're not going with a commercial carrier with lots of other sheep and cattle and people who don't know them and don't understand how they operate. So unloading them, um, when it was just my sheep going down, I just used to call them off the trailer into the pen at the abattoir where they were going to rest overnight. Now we've got sheep coming from different flocks. I'm having to alter how I manage that. And in fact, rather than call, calling off sheep that don't know me, um, we're going to alter how we do it in future and let them come off themselves with no people in sight. They'll be pleased to come off the trailer, and as long as there's no people in sight, they'll, they'll do it very calmly. So we want them to be stress-free. The abattoir staff, who are superb, want them to be stress-free for both welfare and meat quality because stress hormones seriously affect the quality of the meat. I do go into some detail on this in the book because I think as a meat-eater myself and 
Many people reading the book will, are omnivorous and will eat meat. I think, I think it's important that we know. The meat you buy in supermarkets that hasn't been through small, high-welfare abattoirs is still pretty tender, and I do, I'm not going to go into details here unless people ask, but I do go into details about how that's possible. Now, last year, we have another little video, very short one. Last year was stressful beyond... Uh, um, end of September, if some of you may remember, there were lots of storms. So the ferry the day before we were booked to travel was cancelled. They were trying to fit too many cars onto the ferry the day we went down, and we got put in the lane. And the only way we could get on the ferry was by having the trailer and the car taken apart and put on separately. That's something I never want to go through again. <laughs> so we've actually moved into earlier September, which gives a higher guarantee of better weather for the crossing, but it does mean the fleece on the sheep is shorter, which reduces the value of some of the tanned skins we produce. So we're looking into producing leather. So you may ask, why do we persevere with this? Well, we do because the sheep we have here in Orkney are the only lost flock sheep of known provenance that exist. And in 2017, the Rare Breed Survival Trust recognized this after studying the records, visiting my flock, photographing every single sheep. We talked about it. Um, Christine Williams was there as well. She is the expert on Boroughray sheep. And it was decided that, yes, these sheep were pure Boroughray, but that they should go on to a supplementary register separate from all the other Boroughray sheep. There was a feeling that they were perhaps different to other Boroughray sheep. However, as this lovely group left, they reminded me that I was now sole custodian of the genes. That was a massive responsibility. Um, within weeks, I'd got a second flock started on Shap and Say with Jenny. So at least that was reducing the risk. One reason for this feeling that Orkney Boroughray sheep were different to other Boroughray sheep is that I'd found the first written information that more sheep were taken off Boroughray than those original six I told you about earlier. Now, all the registered sheep on the main register are said to be descended from those three breeding pairs. That I question that now, and I discuss that in full in the book, but the feeling was, now we know there were more sheep that had come off, that perhaps mine came from different stock. Oops, wrong way. There we go. Right, on the left there is an article from the RBST journal, The Ark, written in 1996, and you'll see in the title, even then they were still calling them the Hebridean Blackface or Boroughray Sheep of St Kilda. And that top photograph is actually from Abro. It's one of the very few photographs that exists, that I know of, of the, the breeding flock with the research done at Abro. And then lower down is another photograph of the sheep on Boroughray. Now, interest in St. Kilda was high, and in 1980, a major exhibition went to Boroughray Island, looking at the geology, um, all the wildlife, and the sheep, the plants, and the sheep. And from the information there, and other information I also track through, you, you follow references, you follow links in bibliographies, I've been able to find that at least 17 sheep have been taken off Boroughray in the 1970s. At least 17. Personally, I feel that that doesn't include the six that were taken off in 1971. I don't think they all went to Abro. And I think there is a good chance that the lost flock sheep come from some of those others. But... I could not prove it. I couldn't find the definitive written proof of this. It may be in 46 boxes of Abro records at 
the University of Edinburgh archives, not classified in any way. One day I may go down, <laughs> camp out, <laughs> and go through the boxes. Oops. But as part of all my hunting around, tracking down, I did find this paper that appears to have nothing to do with sheep, molecular ecology. Now, the genetics thing being done here hadn't even been discovered when I was doing a bit of genetics at medical school. Introgression and the fate of domesticated genes in the wild mammal population. Their wild mam mammal population was so a sheep. And what they did, what they wanted to look at, was whether there'd been any crossbreeding in the past with dunface sheep because they knew dunface sheep had been taken to St. Kilda hundreds of years ago. Now, the, the interest in the borrowed sheep was because they were thought to feral dunface sheep. And this is where it gets very interesting because I found, when I looked further, I found that the same authors had written an article for the single Soe sheep project, and it was understandable. I could actually understand what they were saying. And what they'd found was that, yes, there had been some crossbreeding, which is why this is a dark Soe sheep, which is why in Sikilda, some of the Soe sheep are lovely golden brown. They had bred with the tan face sheep. Their research also involved looking at the genes of Borrowe sheep because they knew they had some done. There must still be a little bit of face in these feral black face sheep. And they looked at more Scottish black face sheep. And they also looked at an African breed, which was some sort of control or test that their research was working. And that's all I can say about that. <laughs> so what was shown was this, and the light green color is Zoe genes. The pink color is Scottish blackface. Ignore the pink on the far side because that's this African breed. And then you have what they're calling Borore, which are dark green. And they say dark green is the Scottish Dunface. And I looked at that and I thought, okay, so what a bit of Scottish on face in the Soe. That's, that's what we're looking at. But there's an awful lot of dark green in Borrowery. In fact, there's almost less pink, less light green in the Borrowery. There is dark green in the Soe. So I don't think they realize the significance of this. When I saw it, I went, Wow, because anyone looking at that is going to say, why are you calling Borore feral blackface? I am convinced from this, and I do go into greater detail in the book, why I am convinced of this. I think Borore are essentially Scottish face. These sheep that were so important in the Highlands of Scotland until the differences that are Scotland's heritage sheep and are recorded as being extinct. You put Scottish dunfaces in Wikipedia, extinct. Look at that. I'm not seeing extinct there. I'm seeing that borrow sheep have been misclassified all these years and that what we actually have are Scotland's genuine sheep. If you think Porch, think not just about wonderful Highland cattle, but also reclaiming our heritage sheep. Uh, weight for size for size, there's actually a lot more horn on Borrowe sheep than on Highland cattle. So, Setiscarth Bollocks, starring again with his magnificent I would like to suggest that we should claim back the heritage. And that's 
some details if you'd like to further. We now have a book telling the story. Thank you so much, Jane. That was uh, a really fascinating talk. I'm just going to remind you, we can go back to that slide in a second. Yeah. Do you mind clicking forward? Yeah. Just in case you want to still ask questions through Slido, you, you can, but don't worry, we'll be going around um, with the microphone as well. So take a chance, think about what questions you might want to have. And I just want to start by asking mm. you, there is a story of you going to Orkney um, and getting a small flock, and suddenly this happened. So at what point did the sheep become so important? Oh. It was a big moment for me when Dora, that first lamb, was born. Yeah, it's, it's been described as pretty powerful writing in the book. It was, I was on my own. Paul was away at the conference he couldn't get out of. And it was a, it was a storm, and it was the middle of the night, and I couldn't go out with a talk to check her because that would have really upset her. I knew she was coming into labour. I could tell behaviour. It was a nightmare. But then there was this lamb at first light in the morning, and this new mother, first time mother. Um, it was a big moment when we produced our first mutton, and I have to thank the Doombie Butcher, Barbara Sinclair. This is when we still have an abattoir, for taking the risk. Her customers loved it. That, yeah, now it's kind of taken over my life. <laughs> and in a great way. Um, you mentioned the abattoir, and actually mm. I briefly want to talk about that. What would it mean for you to have another abattoir in Orkney and not have to go through the rigmarole of going back to the mainland? Uh, it's, it's not just what it means for us. Um, we, because we work together as a collective, we, we can manage, we can have, cope with these awful costs. I mean, the ferry alone is over £200. And then you've got a 110-mile drive, and we all know what diesel costs nowadays. Um, it will complete, completely change it. I mean, we only survive because we put so many other goods. Although there's an part of our ethos is to use the entire... There's a sacredness to a life being taken. So we really want to use everything. We don't want anything to go to waste. We're now looking, actually, at using the abdominal fat to um, make skin products. You know, we'll try and find a use for everything. Needles from the leg bones. Um, there's a Viking craft called gnarl binding, which uses needles, and bone needles are the best. So um, one of our... Orkney Barre Farmers has actually made some needles. It, it seems to be an amazing way to bring yeah. back old crafts and old yeah. ideas. But more than just us, we are the only people I know of doing this, taking sheep down to Dingwall. Um, you think what it would mean for the crofters and the small-scale farmers in Orkney to be able to farm bread and be to produce meat for home consumption, for tourists, and also for export. Next year, um, we're working with a butcher who is probably going to be exporting our meat. I mean, that's huge. Speaking of, <laughs> we've got a couple of questions in from Slido, and I promise I'll throw to the floor in a second. Uh, two questions about products. One is, can we buy Borore mutton in Orkney? And the second is, have you tried making, uh, collecting milk and making cheese from it? Ah, right. Um, sadly, at the moment, you can't buy it from an Orkney butcher, but um, you can mail order from um, Macbeth's. Sadly, I think they've almost sold out. But if you were to get onto Macbeth's website, as soon as you get home, there is a little, and dash up to walk. So, yes, you can try some. Um, it, is, it is very special. At the 2017 British Brewery Tasting in Edinburgh, which is a wonderful piece of work done as part of a PhD, and we supplied our, our borrowing. That research was not available for a while, but we were back hosting it on our site again so people can read it and you can read about the difference in the mutton from different breeds there was an informal 
vote, yes, but favour, which would be subjective. But I'm very proud to say that it was a joint favourite, which was Shetland, Lamb, Shetland Mutton and Our Mutton, and they came out favourite. And any cheese? Yes, it certainly was hugely important. Um, we couldn't do it ethically by taking lambs away, but often uh, you will have twins for one year and a single next year, so she can eat, produce enough milk for us to take off that a second lamb would have had. Um, Nathan in Stronsay at the moment is the keenest go, so we've acquired the Bible um, making cheese from sheep milk, and he has the book, and um, hopefully it'll happen, but it's something we want to try. I look forward to tasting it. Uh, right, I'm going to throw the floor and see if anyone has a question, raise your hand, and Erin is going to come around. We've got one right here. Hi, Jay. I was just wondering if you know how many sheep are still left on Borrowry. Yes, it's really interesting, actually. It's said that there are 400. Although the population seeing good years rises and then there's a bit of crash, as is normal with wild population. But when they were doing the 1980 study, they actually got most cows done by boats going round the outside because it's incredibly difficult to get onto the borrow end. Um, they actually went onto the island to count them and they came up with, I think, something like 700. So that was obviously a good year, but it's sort of on that, you mentioned that the diet um, of Borrowry sheep was, it seemed to be slightly more diverse than mm. um, sheep, uh, modern breeds of sheep. How does, how does on Borrowry, Borrowry itself do you know? Um, it is mostly different sorts of grasses. Um, it's incredibly high fertility because birds poo. You do things with sheep, poo keeps popping up. Um, and yeah, they're huge in that red uh, document I showed you, the 1980 research, about all the plant life. So, yes, they did in the trees to browse on. But when they were in the highlands, of course, they would have been. And certainly, I, I use rotational grazing and electric fencing. And when I moved them to a new section in the summer, first of all, for the umbellifers, cow parsley, meadow, sweet, gobble. gobble. Then they go for... Um, lots of other plants, then they'll start on the grass. And it can, if people are pruning branches, uh, willows are favourite. We put those in and they absolutely go crazy for those. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go back to Laura for a second. Anyone else got a question? Just now, one up there. Hi, I just wanted to ask, uh, of yours and the other flocks now, is there enough uh, sheep to have genetic diversity or do you actually see that one day perhaps having to uh, arrange for some more to come back to keep, that, keep the diversity and prevent inbreeding? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, firstly, it's been deemed that no sheep we take borrowing. Um, that thing that was settled in 1981, I think. Um, we have a very small population. Um, I have four lines and 11 new lines. We don't have problems because they've been this enclosed population on the island for centuries. The any weak genes, any bad mutations just didn't breed and died out. Um, Bob and Anne Cook, who kept their flock almost feral in that, again, they weren't breeding for anything weak. We, anything we get is quite strong or doesn't look quite right or maybe has a slightly undershot or overshot jaw. We, we look after them. Uh, we definitely raise and cherish them and they will almost certainly go for mutton. We wouldn't breed from them. We only breed from what is the strongest and healthiest. And we're not breeding to a type. It's not like dog breeding where you're breeding to win in shows. We are actually trying to retain the diversity the phenotype diversity within our flocks, which means that we are not breeding out the smaller sheep. That, that's an important part of the diversity. And they may well have greater resilience to other things we don't know about. So um, we, we have to deal with the fact that we are producing... This carcass weights varied from 14 kilograms 
to 28 kilograms. So, but fortunately, Jock Gibson, superb butcher, we, we, we cope with that. And he's used to it, demanding identikit carcasses. So that's how we do it, breeding from the healthiest. And with this ethical idea um, of not breeding to win, as mm -hmm. you say, how, if Borrowe sheep became this national symbol in Scotland again, and there were more mm -hmm. and more flocks, how do you think you would be able to keep that ethos going? Is um, it possible? I don't know, actually. That's a really good question. Because what's happened in England, where enthusiasts have kept this breed going for decades. Let's not get away from that. Without these people who love and cherish their sheep and enjoy showing them, without them, I think the breed in the UK would possibly have died out, outside St Kilda. But I think, when I look at them, I think some of them are getting smaller. Because as you get older and you're showing, it's easier to manage a smaller sheep. I think that might be what's happening. And certainly, yes, they are breeding for what will win. Um, they are doing it responsibly, though. I mean, these are the registered sheep. In the, it's the Soe and Borrowe Society. And they pay great attention to the genetics. And within the RBST, all the sheep breeds, they are one of the breeds that is increasing its genetic diversity because of very careful breeding. So they are absolutely to be applauded for that. What would happen in Scotland? I guess there would be breeding for massive horns. Um, they, they would probably be using Borrowe sheep already in mainland Scotland. Um, I, we're not, we've not yet discussed as a community whether we are prepared for any of our sheep to go outside Orkney. That would be a community decision. Thank you. Uh, I've gonna got a couple of questions on Slido, but I'm going to throw them to the floor just in case anyone has a burning desire for a question. No, I'm going to go back to Slido just now then. Um, one just came through. Do you think it would be a good breed for someone who has little to no farming knowledge? Oh, definitely. Oh, great. Definitely. <laughs> um, we, we Let's all get have, some. We actually have some first-time farmers here. I'm not going to embarrass them by. Um, yes, because they are such low input. They look after themselves. Um, decent fencing helps. They, they don't actually jump. Um, they, they creep under. And you wouldn't <laughs> believe what they can creep under. So um, old bits of wood and old uh, stones, and so we, we fill in the little gaps. Um, but yes, they are very healthy, resilient sheep. You can get them very tame. Um, mine follow me round because they expect to be moved to a new bit of pasture. They've adapted to electric fencing incredibly well. Um, we all farm our sheep in different ways, and that's, and that's actually what I want. I want diverse, diversity is good. Um, but yes, lambing, they pretty much get on with it themselves. So yeah, healthy, resilient sheep that lamb themselves. You did use the word, and I can't remember in mm. what context, but you used the word pet earlier. Yeah. And I wondered, do you view them as livestock, as pets, as what would you call them? Uh, yes, I mean, that, that was the, my original plan. I was going to move to a nice house, a nice modern warm house <laughs> with a little field. We ended up with an old croft house and 25 acres. Um, yes, they would have been pets. Um, one or two of my sheep are kind of a bit more pets. Um, they like me, they come to me, um, they get little treats. Um, You've got favourites, is what I, you're I have us. favourites. Um, we, we do have a use for some elderly ewes when they're retired from breeding. When, when the lambs do have to be separated from the mothers, which has to be when the mothers go to the rams for mating, tupping it's called, um, I find it useful because we're quite high up in West Mainland, we get some pretty awful weather, we're sort of 80 metres above sea level. Um, to have one or two older ewes with the group of lambs, and they sort of look after them. So any of my favourite retired ewes, can, that's their lifelong role. Um, otherwise, our older ewes, um, when they've had a really good rest from lambing, a year or more, they're in beautiful condition. Yes, they do go for mutton, and actually anyone getting the older sheep is lucky because after the superb hanging, I think from personal experience there's even more depth of flavour. 
Um, so, yes, that's what happens. Thank you. So we've got, we have time for a couple more questions. I've got one from Slido and then I'll mm -hmm. come back to you. Um, back to the abattoir, someone asks, why is no abattoir anymore and who decides this? <gasps> oh, <laughs> I try to be very polite in the book. Don't be, don't be here. <laughs> Stornoway Council owns and operates Stornoway Abattoir, which makes such a vast difference to the Stornoway crofters. Personally, I think given the, amount, the importance of agriculture to Orkney's economy and the opportunities there could be for diversification into specialist meats and much more small-scale farming and crofting, I think Orkney Council are making a mistake in not doing the same. Thank you. We noticed a question down here. There, it's just there. Feel for people who don't have much farming. Mm -hmm. If somebody wanted to set a flock up, as in start one, what would be the number you would recommend? Oh, um, we've set up one flock with. Um, three ewes, one ram, and a weather. The weather is important because that's a companion for the ram for the majority of the year when he's not with the ewes because it's unkind to keep a ram on his own. Um, so, yes, it can be as little as... If it's a breeding flock, yes, it can be as small as five sheep. Breeding flock? Um, non, well... A non-breeding flock would be someone doing stores, I guess. Stores are where you take live, um, sheep or cattle and at a younger age, or perhaps they're thinner, and you build them up and fatten them up so they are ready for slaughter. That's what stores are. So a non-breeding flock. Um, the only other thing would be if someone was to have a flock just for their fleece, that might be a non-breeding flock. Um, you'd have trouble making... you. I don't think you can make that pay. You'd have to have a lot of land so you weren't buying in hay or anything. It would be a very low, but so you've got the annual vaccination. You've got, um, we, we test for worms by doing, it's called fecal egg counts. Did you really, th yes, I didn't think I'd be talking about poo so quite so much tonight. But it's, you take a sample of dung and take it to the vet and they tell you what the worm load is. So you're only worming if the sheep absolutely need it. And our adults, um, it's very rare for adult borrowers to need any wormer at all, even use when they're pregnant. It's just the lambs, really. So, yeah, it, c it could be quite small. But, yes, you, you have to have more than just fleece to make a profit. So hands up who's going to get some borrowers sheep after tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got time for one more question, if anyone has a hand. Thank you. Actually, um, if you don't mind, I've got two questions. <laughs> Our, one was an observation when the, the ewe was having the lamb. Mm -hmm. I noticed there was no umbilical cord, if that's the right word. It, it broke unseen. Oh, it broke unseen, so yeah, they and don't because, chew it. Because the lamb hadn't stood up yet. Yeah. So when the lamb did stand up a few minutes later, you could yeah. you could see it. It's usually about that long. Right. Um, no, I was just curious. But we, we don't, because they're lambing outside on clean ground, not in a mm -hmm. shed with straw and all sorts of bugs and germs, we don't need to be dashing around with iodine on the umbilical cord and navel. We, we actually... Don't touch them. Often it's several days before I even know what sex a lamb is. Oh, right. Because we just leave them undisturbed to form a strong bond. Right. Okay, my second question, if you don't mind. Uh, it's a semantic. <laughs> At what point does lamb become mutton? Ah, yeah. Um, <laughs> up to one year, legally, um, a sheep up to one year old is lamb. Right. Slight complication in the abattoirs do it by whether they've got their full set of front adult teeth. They have eight teeth on their bottom jaw at the front, which they have baby teeth as lambs, and then, just like humans, they get their permanent teeth. Um, between one year and two years old, it's called hoggett. Unless you're on the Isle of Man, when 18-month-old sheep on the Isle of Man are called lamb, that's the Manx Lockton sheep, 
um, mutton must be at least two years old, and prime mutton must only be from ewes or castrated males, wethers, or wedders as they're called in Orkney. Oh, so a male meat can be mutton? Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, we actually do eat um, rams that we home slaughter. We, we never send rams down to Dingwall. Um, it's not acceptable for all sorts of reasons. Um, we eat our ram meat if, if, we have a, if we home slaughter a ram because there is this theory floating around that ram meat, because rams in modern breeds are pretty smelly at certain times of the year with all the hormones, that the meat is tainted. Well, Boroughray rams aren't nearly as smelly, and the meat is beautiful. Um, so, yes, that's what we eat, um, our, our rams. <laughs> yeah. now, uh, personally speaking, I, I do know that mutton uh, is for, it's a distinct taste. Oh, yes. Yeah. And it's, uh, yeah. it's quite hard to find, actually. Yeah, th there is a mutton renaissance going on. There's a fantastic book and website called Much Ado About Mutton. Um, but if you go to butchers like um, Macbeth's in Forres and onto their website and, and Google, J Jock does different breeds throughout the year. Um, and he will do a lot of mutton, as do lots of other small specialist butchers. And they will post them out, even to Orkney. So get Googling. <laughs> Uh, and, or go on to the Much Ado About Mutton website where you'll find listed all the people producing different breeds of mutton. Thank you so much. I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap it up yes. there. Although, just before we go, do you want to tell us all the names that your daughter gave to your sheep? Is it just Bollocks? or um, a, a Bollocks is the notorious one. Bollock, bollocks is notorious. Uh, and on that, uh, I think we're going to leave it there. Um, but hopefully Jane will be able to hang around for a few minutes outside. Oh, absolutely. Yes, I'll hang around there, sign books, chat. Oh, of yeah. course, we have a book signing, which I was definitely going to forget to mention. So her new book, her first book, uh, will be outside. She will sign it. Um, if for some reason someone doesn't buy it tonight, where can they get that? Oh, the Orcadian Bookshop in Orkney. Um, I think the Tweed, Orkney Tweed Shop is selling some as well. If you're on Chapinsay, the community centre. Um, there's various outlets in Orkney that are stocking it, but the Orcadian Bookshop is the, the big place I know about. Brilliant. So please do go and buy it. Um, just to say, if the... the if you've or any other been to some feedback forums and the chairs, uh, there's also a QR code I think you can scan of the way out. Please do leave feedback. It really helps us. It helps us find a new audience and to put this festival on year after year. You can also say you liked it on social media. We've got all of them now. Some I don't think I've even heard of myself. But Facebook, Instagram, uh, link, Twitter, whatever it's called now. Um, but J X X. <laughs> Um, but I just want to say thank you so much, Jane. Thank Can you. we give her one big round of applause before we go? Thank you. And have a great night.